uh, and welcome everyone on behalf of my colleagues in Africana. Uh, I would like to welcome you all uh, for taking the time. Uh, it's such a very busy moment across campus with so many uh, events uh, going. So thank you for, for being here. Uh, our panel uh, this afternoon is entitled Thinking Through Michelle Obama, Black Studies and Black Feminism. Uh, the panel is part of the Africana uh, Fall uh, Colloquium series entitled Race and the Presidency. And the year long theme uh, about that, which is Freedom, Democracy, and Citizenship. So before I introduce our stellar group of uh, panelists, I would like to mention that this series is co sponsored by the Office of the Academic and Diversity Initiative, uh, American Studies Program. Uh, Central Diversity Officers, Cornell Institute for Public Affairs, Cornell United Religious Work, Department of English, Office of Faculty and Diversity, sorry, of Faculty and Diversity and Development, uh, Department of Feminist, Gender and Sexuality Studies, Department of Government, uh, Freedom and Free Societies Funding, the Department of History, Department of Inclusion and Workforce Diversity, Intercultural Programs, Department of Music, Department of Near Eastern Studies, Office of Inclusion, Professional Development and the Graduate School, in addition to the Society of the Humanities. Uh, it's important to mention them as we really lend their support to make this uh, a success. Before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to just mention a few matters of uh, organization regarding the panel. Each participant will have about 10 to 15 minutes maximum to give a presentation, and this will allow about one hour for uh, our uh, moderator who is also uh, a participant in the panel, I must say, to, uh, that's Professor Dabrani Guy Sheftow, uh, to comment and moderate the discussion with the participant and also for uh, audience uh, participation. We'll end with the reception, of course, and hopefully this will give us a chance to carry on with the conversation uh, and discussion at an informal level. Our panel today features a group of nationally and internationally well-known prolific scholars with long-term interest in issues of black women studies and the intersection of gender, feminism, and African studies. Uh, the, panel, the panel, as I mentioned, will be moderated by uh, Professor Beverly Kaishatka. Uh, our panelists, uh, of course, in addition to Professor Beverly Kaishatka, include our own African colleagues, Professor Carl Lewis Davis, uh, Professor Richard Richardson, and Professor Mediwe Brooks. Allow me now to introduce the, the panelists, and in the interest of time, I will be very brief in my introductions. My apologies in advance, I just want to do justice to their remarkable accomplishment and career, which could easily take the whole time of the allotted, or allotted to the panel, if I have to account uh, for them fully. So let me start with our uh, guest, uh, Professor Beverly Gashemtal, who is no stranger to Africana, she has been a long time friend. She has been very supportive as we went through uh, the building of Africana itself and the new hires as a member of the uh, advisory board or advisory group of scholars uh, for Africana studies. Uh, Professor Kai Sheftal is the founding director of the Women in Studies and Research uh, Resource Center uh, and Anna Julia. Cooper, Professor of Women's Studies at Spelman College. She is past president of the National Women's Association. Her most recent books, and I, as I said, I'm just going to try to be very brief uh, because these are just few of our publications, include uh, Still Brave, The Evolution of Black Women's Studies, uh, uh, Who Should Be First, Feminists Speak Out on the uh, 2008 presidential campaign, which she coordinated with. Uh, a long-term collaborator, Professor Joanetta Cole. Prior to these books, she has published a number of texts within African American and women's studies, which have been noted as seminal books by other scholars, including the first anthology on black women literature, Steady Black Bridges, Visions of Black Women in Literature, in 1980, which she called it with Rosianne Bell and Betty Parker Smith, and also Words of Fire. An anthology of African American feminist thought in 1995, and co authored with Joanetta Paul uh, the groundbreaking work Gender Talk, the struggle for women equality in African American communities. 
in uh, 1983, I must mention that, she became the, company, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, the founding co-editor of SAGE, a scholarly journal of black women studies, uh, that was devoted exclusively to the experiences of women of African descent. Uh, let me just come then to also uh, briefly mention uh, my, uh, the bias of, of, of my uh, colleagues. Uh, let me start with Professor Carol Boyce Davis, uh, who is a professor in Africana Studies and Research Center, also in the English Department at Cornell. She was a professor uh, at Africa New World Studies at Florida International University in Florida, in Miami, Florida, when she was recruited uh, to build which she did, the African New World Studies Program, and served as its director for three successful uh, three-year appointments, uh, which definitely have seen or witnessed the moving of the program to international fame and recognition. Professor Carol Boyce Davis held distinguished professorship at a number of institutions, including the Hesperus Professor of African Studies and a Professor of Comparative Literary Studies at African American Studies at Northwestern University. She is the author of several books, and I will mention a few here. Uh, that is including Black Women, Writing and Identity, Migration of the Subject from 1994, and Left of Karl Marx, Gloria Jones, uh, Black Communist Woman, that was published by Duke University in 2007. In addition to numerous books, scholarly article, Professor Carl Boyce Davis has published the following Critical Anthologies in Gambia, Studies of Women in African Literature, uh, with our colleague uh, Anne Adam here in the audience. Uh, out of Kumba, Caribbean uh, Women and Lit uh, Literature, published in 1990, and a two volume collection of critical and creative writing entitled Moving Beyond Boundaries, that was published in, 19, sorry, in 2003. Uh, she also, she was also the general editor of the Encyclopedia of African Diaspora. Uh, published uh, in 2010, and most recently she published the uncontainment Claudia Jones' activism, clarity and vision, which contain the writings of uh, Claudia Jones. Professor Carl Boyce David is soon to publish a series of personal reflections for Caribbean spaces between the Twilight Zone and the Underground Railroad, uh, dealing with issues uh, of transnational Caribbean American black identity. Uh, Professor Richard Richardson, who is also uh, a colleague at Africana here, is currently an associate professor, uh, and she serves <coughs> as director of undergraduate studies. She is a scholar of African American literature, with additional specialties in American literature, gender studies, and southern studies. Born and raised in Montgomery, Alabama, she attended Spelman College. She also received a PhD from Duke University in 1998. Uh, essays have been published also in many journals, uh, such as American Literature, Mississippi Quarterly, the Forum of uh, Modern Language Studies, Black Renaissance Noir, uh, Transatlantic uh, and Inca Journal of Contemporary Art Now. Her first book, Black Masculinity and the U.S. South from Antiquity to Gangster, was published in, in 2007 and was highlighted by choice books among the outstanding academic titles. Uh, of 2008. Uh, her book in progress uh, it examines uh, black femininity, the U.S. and the global south. Uh, since 2005, she has served as co-editor of, uh, of the New Southern Studies book series at the University of Georgia Press. And as a visual artist, that's another dimension of her uh, life, which is the creative side, it's like the academic work has been uh, features uh, in several solo and group uh, museum exhibitions and in two short documentary films. In January 2009, she visited Paris, France as a cultural envoy of the U.S. Embassy in France and was featured in their speaker series, Sua Grant in the U.S. State Department, and honored with a talk and exhibition and film is screening at the ambassador's residence. Uh, the last uh, of our uh, panelists here is uh, Professor Noriwe Brooks, who is, has just joined us this year from Princeton. Uh, she is an associate professor in Africana Studies and a specialist in gender, sorry, and also in the program of Feminine Gender and Sexuality Studies. She's a member of this. Uh, she is an interdisciplinary scholar who works on the racial implications of beauty, fashion, and adornment, racial inequality in education, race, migration, 
the urbanization of black women studies. She has published several books, and I will just cite a few. Uh, Hair Raising, Beauty and Culture, and African American Women, uh, which was published in 1960, sorry, 1996, uh, and was awarded by Choice, uh, the Outstanding Academic Book of 1997, uh, and selected by the Public Library Association as an Outstanding University Press Book in 1997. Uh, another publication includes Lady Stages, African American Women Magazines and the Culture That Made Them, published in 2004, and uh, our most famous work, uh, which is on black, in the history of black studies in the United States, entitled White Money, Black Power, the History of African American Studies, <coughs> and Advice to Race in Higher Education, which was published in 2006. And she was also associate editor of a book. Called Paris Connections, African American Artists in, in, in Paris, uh, which was published in 1992, and also an editor also of another uh, book entitled Black Women Studies. I mean, uh, I will stop here, as I said, if I continue to take time. I hope I don't take much time. Uh, but then you can see it is actually, as I described it, a panel of the stellar scholars. So, welcome everyone, and welcome. Good afternoon. I am very pleased to return to Africana Studies. There was a point in which it seemed like my second home and participate in your year long colloquium. I am especially honored to moderate this panel for several reasons. I have a special connection to the panels, all of them. Professors Richard Richardson and Ole Woods, because we are Spelman alumni, and they were at Spelman when I was in the English department. I also have a very special relationship with Carol Morse Davies, with whom I have worked on several projects over many years, and who has come to the Women's Center at Spelman and as we engage in important, transgressive, global, black feminist solidarity activities. It is also the case that Jeanette Cole and I co-edited a collection of readings in the wake of that historic 2008 U.S. presidential campaign entitled, uh, Who Should Be First? in which we tried to capture the agony and the ecstasy of that moment in U.S. history when an African-American male and a white female were seeking Democratic nomination. You may recall uh, during that period that all hell broke loose, metaphorically speaking, among feminists surrounding the issue of the urgency of race gender matters during that historic bid for the White House. Because of the importance of having for the first time an African American in the White House as First Lady, we were anxious to have an article on Michelle Obama and included an essay by a young scholar, Erica Coleman, entitled Michelle Obama on My Mind. Professor Coleman anticipated quite prophetically the dilemmas Michelle was likely to face as a first black first lady. She reminded us of the stereotypes of black womanhood that are indelibly etched in the psyche of American society. And feminist critic Michelle Wallace asserted during the time that black women have, have a hell of a history to live down. It is this hell of a history that Michelle Obama must contend with and overcome, a Coleman went on to assert. My role as moderator this afternoon involves making some very brief opening remarks and following uh, the presentations of our panelists. I will pose a few questions that they have raised and maybe a couple of their, of their papers suggest uh, based on their talks and then open the floor for dialogue between the audience and our panelists. And hopefully we'll have about an hour for that. Following the invitation for me to join this panel, I was quite pleased. I returned to my Michelle folk which actually I had been keeping for the past four years. And then spent many hours, much too many hours, poring over the enormous amount of material that circulates on the internet. It is probably the case that no other first lady has generated so much commentary. In fact, since 2008, there has been an outpouring of popular and scholarly assessments of all aspects of Michelle Obama's life. Her marriage, her fashion choices, First Lady projects, debates about her mom and chief self-designation, her allegiances or not to feminism, her makeover, 
from angry black women you may recall to one of the most popular women in the world. The racist portrayals of her in the media, including the most recent one in that Spanish magazine where she was depicted as a semi-new African slave. Uh, that article is entitled Michelle Randall of a Slave. You might really want to read it. It's really uh, unbelievable. She has been the subject of serious scholarly treatments by black feminists such as Rebecca Wanzo, one entitled Black Love is Not a Fairy Tale, Melissa Harris Perry's reading to Michelle, The Gender Politics of Race in the Age of Obama. I might also mention that Michelle teaches a course at Tulane on First Ladies, in which Michelle features prominently. I don't know what she says, of course. Uh, Kathy Cohen's Black Love, Black Deviance, and the Politics of Morality in the Age of Obama. She, uh, Kathy, has spoken which I think is really good, about the perils of idealizing heteronormative nuclear families, including in African-American uh, communities. Despite the seductiveness of this project, given dismal marriage statistics, a cap reminds us of, of why this could be problematic. One of the things that I uh, uh, hear a lot moving around among young black women is this what I call uh, looking for Obama. Uh, project <laughs> on young African American women who think that Obama is the perfect manifestation and embodiment of black manhood, and they hope to find one out there. There is also Deja White, Michelle Obama, redefined the White Housewife, which appeared in the new journal called Third Space. Before turning to our panelists, I want to begin with just a very, very few comments of my own. Very, very few. The first thing I want to say is putting on my generational black woman hat. Uh, Michelle is a very familiar black woman to me. Uh, competitive, I mean, a competent, grounded, solid, stable, take charge. She's also very familiar to me in another regard in the sense that she states very openly her ambivalence to feminism. And I just mentioned one quote from Washington Post that was particularly compelling to me. You know she said, I'm not that much into labels. I mean, the question was, do you consider yourself a feminist? You know, I'm not that much into labels. So probably if you lay, if you lay out the feminist agenda, I would probably agree with a large proportion of it. I wouldn't identify as a feminist, just like I probably wouldn't identify as a liberal or progressive. I like the candor of that statement, but I wish we could talk to her more about it. So that ambivalence, she really underscores. Number two, I think black women are most palatable to various public audiences, including African-American ones, when we embrace patriarchal family structures. And I think Michelle is no exception. And I think that we, when we are publicly very embracing of our partners, as Michelle is, we really get 100% A plus weight. I'm not necessarily making a comment about it, but I will just say that. <laughs> and then finally, I would just say the complexity and fascination on the part of many publics with Michelle Obama calls, I think, for more gatherings such as this one, as we attempt to make sense of perhaps the most public and popular and controversial African American woman in our lifetime. So those are my little comments. Both 
uh, black studies as well as black feminism. Uh, and I titled this, for people who do black feminist studies and for those of you students who do not recognize the allusion to double jeopardy, um, it is a classic text that comes out of, should be black studies as well as black feminist studies, it was written by Francis Beale in 1969. Um, and it was right as the civil rights movement is wrapping itself up, the black power movement is rising, and women's studies right, is working itself out. And the question for black women at that time was always, right, is it, is it race or is it gender? What, where are your allegiances? Uh, and it was always posed as a either or. So in 1969, Francis Beale did a little pamphlet that was called Double Jeopardy that talked about how, for black women, there was no either or, it was at the same time. And then for black women, economics, um, yeah, politics, economic, black female bodies were impacted all at the same time. And it seemed to me that, that what I began initially to think was, are we at a moment where Michelle Obama asked us to um, update and make new that thinking about double jeopardy, that um, first, second wave black feminist uh, scholarship and writing that talked a lot about what it meant to be black and female at particular moments? Or does thinking about Michelle Obama really take us back to um, the changing sands? Right? Is it a difference? without a distinction to talk about her in this period, or in fact, is the first black first lady <laughs> make, uh, make all of those kinds of uh, issues collide differently. So the gender politics of race when having it all. So the having it all, and then I'm narrating this, I'm not going to read it to you, <laughs> this is just for the first issue, right, which is the terms of the um, conversation around each other. Really is this summer, my former colleague, um, uh, Professor Slaughter, authored an article about how difficult it was for her as a member of the Obama, uh, yeah, the, the Obama administration working in Hillary Clinton State um, She had taken a leave, she had two young children, uh, well, two teenage children, uh, she had taken a leave from Princeton and had to come back after two years because she had teenagers. Those of you who have had teenagers, um, understand why she had to come back. Uh, those of you who've been teenagers, if you remember the hell of they had friends in their own households and would have called your mother back from the State Department. Drones be damned. Um, so the thing, the, the, the conversation around this having it all really had a generational divide. It really became um, one of extremely privileged and elite white women who were at a certain kind of, um, occupied a certain kind of space in American culture, politics, corporate world society, um, after 1980, claimed that it was really almost impossible for them to juggle both having, well, not just working, but working in a certain kind of high profile uh, environment and child rearing. And so Anthony <coughs> makes this decision to come back and, Pretty much, uh, it divides, like I said, on gender lines. People pre-1980 are sort of like, and black women, let me say. We're pretty much like, what are you thinking? Like, you always, you know, like people have always had to work and take care of their kids. What, like, how is this breaking you down? How is it that you have, you have health care, you are paid well, and you have help in your home, and you can't figure out how to negotiate motherhood? Um, you can't negotiate parenting. Is that a failure on your part, or on the culture's part, as she claims? And she claimed that the culture, patriarchal culture, made it impossible for her to do those things. Um, women after 1970 are like, yeah, the kind of work that we are doing, or not after 1980, uh, graduated college after 1980, they're saying the kind of work that we're doing is significantly different, such that to be in the State Department is not necessarily the same as going and working in 9 to 5. And so your understanding of juggling has to be revised. Um, because the consequences for them, they're saying as the president of Google, um, as a politician, as someone who has um, all of these responsibilities, maybe that juggling has a different kind of balance. And so I started out really with this paper thinking about what, what do all of those um, issues, how do they collide in this particular time? And it brought me back to Audre One, I have these up here because they are two of my favorite quotes in the and both Audre and James Baldwin are under talk 
and under love. And so when I can, um, I use them <laughs> in my work because I just think y'all need to hear the real me that is them on a regular basis. However, in this instant, um, I think that they have something to add to this conversation around what it means to, um, to be in existence is a part of certain groups when we assume um, space in society. Right? I'll just leave y'all to, to, uh, to go ahead then. I'm not too bad So, <laughs> Michelle was coming to the moment she's Okay, so the three things that I want to talk about really briefly, right, is setting this context is gender and it's, it's black studies and black feminism. Really briefly, I'm going to drive out of here. Um, are what I said about her being a crossroads for gender and race. I also want to talk briefly about this arc of transformation that she went through between 2008 and today that uh, Professor Ashley was all alluded to. Um, it's quite stunning, and I just want to briefly remind you of who she was in 2008 and, and who she was today, and talk some about what that means for gender and race politics today, like why she has to be who she is. And then um, I want to talk just very, very briefly about this trope of uh, angry black women, which comes up repeatedly in talking about her, but ask if um, that's really the only stereotype that she's grappling with. It's the one that we consistently hear, um, but are there ways that there's other things she's working with? So I want to start with um, this video. So in 2008, this is really short, it's a one minute. Um, so in 2008, um, this is when she just first started campaigning. Nobody really knew who she was or who Barack was, right? Uh, and they're just starting to make some noise. And she's actually really popular. People kind of like Michelle at first, you know? Like she seemed real. They like her in part because she consistently talks about the president's imperfections. She said something along the lines of, you know, I understand that some women do marriages, some political wives do marriages where they are consistently subservient to their husband. That's not who we are. We're doing this differently. Um, and she goes on to list some ways. <laughs> she is not that. Um, and people are kind of feeling that they're figuring it out like they're figuring him out. Then in the space of three months, there are a couple of things that take place. I just want to remind you of this one. Exactly what she means. None of that was at play. 
Two weeks later, um, my former institution blindsided the campaign by releasing her senior thesis. Two weeks after she's saying this, right? And it's, it's still, you know, people are still bubbling up and what does this mean? And we think there are all kinds of radicals and it's a big problem. And despite the fact that they had told the campaign that they would warn them ahead of time, they did not. They just released it. And so in the midst of dealing with this, they're blindsided by this thesis that undergraduates, you may understand, it sounds like what y'all said, well, what, what sometimes in class it sounds to me like y'all sit around and talk about. Um, sort of what does it mean to be in an elite institution, elite white institution? What does that say about, or how does that impact the feelings of empathy that you have for black communities and for in black communities? Does, is, is, a, is the price of the ticket for, for inhabiting these spaces that you have got to think about your future as separate from the best interests of those people. And she's talking very honestly in her thesis about how, you know, for her, uh, that's exactly what it started to happen. While she may have had some particular plan when she came to the institution, she's now starting to think about some different ways. She now wants to go to Harvard Law School as opposed to going straight back to Chicago Southside. Right? She's talking about this she's um, again, this does not go over well. It's kind of like she's alienated, she's angry, she should be grateful that she's sitting up at Princeton, and you know, here she is with a whole big critique of you know what what, what why black people um, think that they'd rather go live in the ghetto as opposed to go to uh, Harvard Law School. Which is kind of interesting when you think about um, Teach for America today, right? Like it's kind of sexy to for at least students to think about leaving elite spaces and go work in the ghetto. Then, at, for, for people thinking about her in the 1980s because she should have been grateful, horrified. So, uh, things are going downhill. <laughs> and she's literally dragging the campaign down, right? Her numbers are so low. Um, the, and and our, she is becoming such a focus that the entire campaign is having to respond to her as opposed to her um, really just being the normal kind of first lady who's smiling, says a couple things, blah, blah, blah. Then in March, of course, the Reverend Wright uh, comments <coughs> hit the news. So now we have this, these images of her one month later, it's a month later, they're still figuring out what to do with this. Um, and you have Reverend Wright. So, can you click? No, no, it's just another. Uh, after hearing what she said, uh, the, the, the release of the, uh, just to give you a sense of how vicious these attacks against her were, they actually start, you know, somebody calls into uh, O'Reilly's show and you know, says, we should get together a lynching party. Which is this kind of strange uh, gender transgression in a way, because generally you're not talking about lynching black women. That's generally something that is saved black men who are both fathers who transgress. Now, you know, it's Michelle. We're going to get us a lynching party, but of course, you know, before we do, we just need to find out if she really thinks we're bad, but you know, that's at least an option. From this point on, they had to, to go into um, really good to a real deep, and then of course this is not just one, but um, the, to a whole kind of image reconstruction. And all of the things that people were kind of feeling about the show in 2008 um, immediately had to be taken stripped out um, of, her, of her public persona. So she could no longer talk about her work life. Right? I mean, that was one of the things that actually, at, the, at least initially, was pulling there fairly well, apparently, that she was a working mother. Uh, Barack was off, you know, in either Springfield or D.C. all the time. He was never around. So she talked openly about having to have primary responsibility for the kids during the week before Barack came back on the weekends. So she talked about the kinds of change, you know, kinds of sacrifices. But people were kind of feeling it, you know, they were like, okay, this is kind of real. She talked about being in debt, uh, being in law school, and having hundreds of thousands of debt, dollars in debt. Um, and people could relate to that. Following these missteps, and again, only because it started to drag the entire campaign down, um, you, would, if you, you would have to dig really hard to have her talk about going to college, um, being a, a, going to law school. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
uh, being a single parent or any kind of issues with, she talked openly about her, she and Barack having had marital issues, having to go to counseling uh, to, to stay together, get themselves right. Not that they were going to get divorced, but I <laughs> think all of that was gone. Um, and it was replaced with this image of the mom in chief that has also gotten her in some trouble. Um, here, just go to the last one. The, the issues with Michelle now really are, like some of the discourses swirling around her body now. You will hear that she is unfeminine. She jumps and falls down on the floor and starts doing push-ups and stuff on the Ellen DeGeneres show. People go crazy. Who does that? What first lady is doing push-ups on the floor? That she is constantly bearing her arm. Um, that is just not, that is her, 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 you will hear people say, this is all like a pop culture thing, right? It's just not feminine. She's gone too far with the muscles. Um, she's not even slim. And then you got some people who just want to call her fat and ugly, and that's a whole other thing. But just around the standards of femininity, people have all kinds of issues. Um, but I find it interesting that one of the ways that she has really fought back against some of this uh, is through fashion. Uh, fashion, which is generally considered sort of in opposition to a mind, in opposition to thinking and to activism, fashion, which is just adornment, um, has actually become part of the battleground for her. Um, and from the choice of the designers uh, to what she wears to how she talks about it, um, it, it meshes with the politics of respectability. She turns herself into someone recognizable in some ways, um, but she puts a stamp on it that keeps her as a singular kind of presence. So that's a, that's a drive-by, like I said, of a larger picture that goes into some detail. And so, you know, hopefully we can talk about some of it. Similarly, 
Citations of Michelle Obama's ancestry in South Carolina, of her descent from slave ancestors who still live there, and her grand grandparents who originally migrated from the state to Chicago, have complemented this urban-centered narrative of her identity and have also been instrumental in her racial and class identification in relation to the U.S. South and an African past. In Michelle, a biography, after mentioning the nexus of migrations for Michelle Obama's family, the Robinsons, in Georgetown, South Carolina, Carolina, Lines of Monday points to these complex circuits of exchange, where she remarks that, quote, ultimately, a half million African Americans would move from the South to Chicago, swelling the city's black population from 2 to 27 percent in 2000. The South Side would be where the majority would settle, though an African-American section would grow up on the West Side as well, and those two populations would expand toward each other and meet, making an L that forms one of the country's largest contiguous African-American populations. Much of the world outside Chicago would assume the South Side was poor and black and criminal. In fact, the South Side has, for much of its history, been economically diverse and culturally vibrant. End quote. Indeed, if we recognize the multiplicity of South-related contexts and temporalities within which she is interpolated, and in her moves through transitional landscapes and contested terrain, we can apprehend the First Lady as a reigning emblem and byproduct of Black Southern and global modernity. Notwithstanding her primary background in urban Chicago, the complex geographical dialectics associated with Michelle Obama additionally point to the usefulness of a regional epistemology that draws on the U.S. South as an interpretive lens. This methodology challenges and expands conventional notions of textuality in fields such as Southern studies and Southern literature, along with conceivable archives for study in these areas, while expanding context for thinking about how factors such as class, race, gender, and geography work in constituting femininity in national and global contexts. Even citations of Michelle Obama's connection to the South area of the city of Chicago seem rhetorically designed to emphasize her intimacy with the closest example of a South in the city, and by extension, link her to black Southern diasporas in the urban North. This rhetoric further clarifies the U.S. South as a migratory, fragmented, dispersed, diverse, and highly unstable concept within the nation, and suggests the instrumentality and indispensability of a global South framework in analyzing the First Lady. The critical recognition of the region's inherent transnationality detaches the U.S. South from its narrow and conventional borders and definitions. At a fundamentally pragmatic level, such epistemologies are also valuable for studying her, I want to suggest, in light of how recurrently both conservative and liberal media have invoked the reactionary literary, cultural, and ideological heritage of the U.S. South and a range of her representations in the nation's public sphere. A story that emerged on the presidential campaign trail and that reveals how Southern racism from her roommate's mother shadowed Michelle Obama's grooming situation as a newly arrived freshman student at Princeton is now well known. In an April 13, 2008 Atlanta Journal and Constitution story by Brian Fagans entitled Georgia Recalls Grooming with Michelle Obama, Alice Brown, the mother of a new Princeton student named Catherine Donnelly, confesses that, quote, I was horrified upon learning that her daughter had been assigned a black roommate. Brown confronted the campus housing office and demanded to get her room changed upon hearing that she had been housed with a young black woman from the south side of Chicago, informing them that, quote, we weren't used to living with black people. Catherine is from the south. According to the piece, Donnelly's mother and grandmother filled her head with racist stereotypes, portraying African Americans as prone to crime, uneducated, and at times, people to be feared. Similarly, the article acknowledges that Brown had also been raised to think that way. As it reports, quote, her grandfather, a sheriff in the North Carolina mountains, bragged about running black visitors out of the county before nightfall, and Brown's parents held onto the N-word like a family heirloom. In her comments, Donnelly indicates her amazement upon seeing her former roommate, then Michelle Robinson, on television as the wife of a Democratic candidate running for the presidency and to share her outstanding achievements. She looks back to their time as roommates at Princeton and expresses regret about her family's racist reaction to this young black woman from Chicago back then. 
On the day that her daughter moved into the dormitory room, Brown's very phrasing and speaking to Princeton's housing office about her disapproval of the black roommate that her daughter had been assigned reflects the separatist view of the U.S. South as being a synonymous with white subjectivity, logic that consigns blacks in the region to irrelevance and invisibility. Similarly, her mother's comments reveal deeply ingrained stereotypes of blackness along with spaces identified with black culture, such as Chicago's South Side. That the effort to move her daughter was urgent and frantic is evident in the article's description of the overnight calling marathon in which Brown engaged with her mother and another friend to find a contact the university who might facilitate a room change. Donald calls her mother, Donald calls her mother, who in turn phoned the friend who had traveled with her to Princeton all those years ago. The friends had stayed up that night, calling everyone they knew with a connection to the university, hoping to get Catherine moved. Quote, we thought this is so ironic, Brown says, Obama could be the first lady in here who wanted to get my child out of her influence. It is much to Donnelly and her mother's credit that after all these years, they chose to come forth and be honest about the thinking in which they had been mired back then and that their views about race have since become more enlightened. The story provides a concrete and sobering illustration of continuing influence of segregationist logic in the post-civil rights era during the early 1980s and confirms its far-reaching impact. While this episode concerning Michelle Obama's freshman roommate at Princeton is loaded with the more pejorative connotations that have been attached to the South Side of Chicago and the cultural imaginary, the Obama presidential campaign framed Michelle Obama's roots in this area as an empowering asset, beginning with a short biographical video narrated by her mother, Marion Robinson, entitled South Side Girl, to introduce Michelle Obama to a national audience on Monday, August 25, 2008, the second night of the Democratic National Convention in Denver, Colorado. Uh, I won't play this video, but you can find it on YouTube. It's about six minutes long if you um, Google it. The video, which is six and a half minutes in length, begins by slowly flashing a photo photograph of Robinson and her daughter Michelle as a small child with close-up facial shots of them on a screen against a black backdrop, an image that emphasizes their close mother-daughter relationship. Describing her as my baby, Robinson gives her daughter's birth date, January 17, 1964, a narrative that stresses her maternal connection and establishes the biographical orientation of the video. Southside Girl acknowledges Michelle Obama's creation of a community center at the University of Chicago, further emphasizing her outreach and her community in Chicago. The video frames Michelle Obama in relation to her roles as a daughter, sister, wife, and mother. Southside occurs as a soundbite in this video, just as the words came back are repeated by her mother and others in describing Michelle Obama's devoted relationship to the area and return home to work there after college. It is notable that an early photo features the Robinson's apartment. Numerous biographical profiles of Michelle Obama, particularly those invested in trace, tracing her journey to the White House, have acknowledged not only her upbringing on the South Side, but also mentioned the spatial constraints in which she grew up in the small apartment on the South Side, where space was so limited that the living room had to be divided by a separator and made into improvised bedrooms for her and her brother. The video links Michelle Obama with a stable and solid family background and depicts her through its narratives, visual interviews and photographs as the product of a two-parent home, the kind that mirrors the structure of what is typically imagined as normative for, American, for the American family. This video narrative of Michelle Obama unsettles the typical pathologies of the South Side of Chicago by describing it as a place where stable, loving black families exist who are capable of raising successful children like Craig and Michelle Obama. Similarly, it reveals the existence of devoted black mothers such as Mary Robinson, in effect further decoupling the South Side from pathology and foregrounding an African-American woman who was a stay-at-home mother raising her children with a husband and a nuclear family. The video's invocation of the word girl echoes the term homegirl and frames Michelle Obama as the byproduct of a rich and stable family as much as it constructs an image of Michelle Obama as down to earth and in touch with everyday people as a woman as her father had been as a man. Furthermore, the mention of her as a girl highlights light and youthful images and offsets media representations of her as angry and revolutionary, the kinds that Professor Brooks highlighted in his presentation, for example. At the same time, and perhaps as a counterpoint to such representations, the moniker girl, like a litany of motifs related to mothering, is 
finally emphasizes Michelle Obama's feminine side. It begs analysis within discourses of black feminism for both linking her to popular discourses of empowerment that invoke girl power as much as for the levels on which it potentially downplays her status as a woman of achievement. These salient references to the South Side anticipated and established foundations for public acknowledgments of slavery in South Carolina and Michelle Obama's family background. At the convention, this narrative of Michelle Obama was instrumental in signifying her family of origins, the Robinsons, as a representative American family and demonstrates how America is fundamentally one nation, in effect aligning them with the overarching theme of that evening's program at the convention. Michelle Obama's speech at the convention the night that Southside Girl premiered, which her brother Craig introduced, echoes the video and primarily framing the South Side as her place of origin. At a rhetorical level, the South Side evokes her in relation to the South of the term, albeit within an urban northern context. The emphasis on her birth and upbringing in a family that lived as her father worked on the South Side and that has long been committed to public service in this area is a portal to the larger narrative that links her family background to the history of the great migration and plantation slavery in the U.S. South and South Carolina. In the national arena, the recurring narratives that make the area synonymous with who she is have in effect made Michelle Obama a reigning symbol of the South Side of Chicago as they have positioned her as one of the nation's foremost ambassadors for the area alongside her husband. As First Lady, the official narratives about Michelle Obama and her public work, such as her profile on the website of the White House, also highlight her origins on the South Side of Chicago. In numerous interviews, Michelle Obama frequently emphasizes her, her roots on the South Side to underscore the barriers that she surmounted and suggests that her achievements are possible for other girls and women. For instance, in an October 2011 interview in Essence, she remarks that, oh, my story to young people around this country and around the world is, don't look at me as a first lady first. Look at me as, a, as Michelle Obama, a girl who grew up on the south side of Chicago, because I was there, and this is attainable. Such interviews have only reinforced the salient emphasis on the south side, the video south side girl, pointing to the, I mean, that the video um, south side girl mentions pointing to the profound significance of space in constructing her identity as a woman. Such citations, to, to conclude, such citations of the South in relation to Michelle Obama were iterated and reinforced through the circulation of the story in the national arena about her family's linkages to slavery on a South Carolina plantation. The linkages of Michelle Obama to the South Side and describing her home and family origins parallel and recast all of the conventional metaphors that signify the region of the South as a home for African Americans in the U.S. In the African American context, invoking Southern groups has frequently served as a strategy for signaling a solid grounding in values in relation to family, religion, tradition, and hard work. Invoking the South also links African Americans to histories of slavery and segregation and traumas of violence, including lynching. The history of the slave experience in the South has linked the region inextricably to black subjectivity in the U.S. and constituted a narrative of the region as a symbolic home for blacks in this nation. That historically, plantation slavery was based in the South and the vast majority of slaves were imported through the region has also shaped the view of the region as the primary linkage to Africa for blacks in the U.S. and constituted its associations with notions of black authenticity and black selfhood. Numerous black politicians positioned on the political spectrum from liberal to conservative have invoked the Southern background in the national arena, as is the case with Condoleezza Rice in the U.S. public sphere. Such references to the South constructing Michelle Obama are grounded in associations with the South of the South with notions of African American authenticity and rhetorically function as a device for associating African Americans with mainstream American values. Such salient implications of the South as a region in the public sphere of politics reveal its continuing serviceability in national and global contexts for shaping and framing notions of identity in American and African American contexts as they reflect the longstanding accessibility of the South as a problem and pariah region and its historical function as what Leanne Douglas analyzed as the nation's region.
spell a little bit here, and I think this is seems to be another one. Hopefully, I'm going to straight away. But I was consulted with Spellman's implementing of the African diaspora in the world, which is the, the equivalent of the Western Civ that a lot of universities have. So that was quite an amazing thing to do. But she's right, we did a lot of transgressive work. And my disclaimer is I, I love to push the envelope. It's never personal, so don't take it like that. But I'm really pleased to be in um, a context of Africana to look at intersecting patriarchy. This is my next paper. The intersecting patriarchy is a Kona's Africana study. So this is a, an amazing um, advancement that there's a panel like this, I'm saying. But that's going to be a whole other paper that I'm still working on. OK, so this you know, happened a while ago. I discovered my computer screen was black. So all this stuff that I had written that I wanted to talk about is not on the screen. What I wanted to do was look at um, what Condoleezza Rice said at the RNC pull out some of that and look at what Michelle said. And I still remember that Condoleezza used, you know, I was a little girl in Birmingham with all the segregation. I look like I grew up in the Secretary of State. And Michelle Obama did a different thing. She said, look at what we all can be. So you see a whole different thing taking place there. But I was really fortunate that I had published a piece called She Wants a Black Man Post. It was a very sexy title because it was sung by a Caribbean Calypsonian. So you have to read all the double entendre in there. Constructions of race, sexuality, and political leadership in popular culture. My next project is on black women and political leadership. So what I'm saying today is going to be putting um, forward some of those ideas that, that I am developing as far as that whole question of women and political leadership is concerned. So what I'm going to do, since I lost what I was going to say, it's not on the screen anymore, it's just pull out some of this that does talk about some of the issues of black women and political leadership as it pertains to Michelle Obama. So, basically what I'm arguing is that there's a rise now of black women to political leadership across the African diaspora. And I'm saying that in a range of organizations, universities, and so on, we already had the practicing of the first lady. In every black church, there's a first lady walking around. So. So there was already sort of the rehearsing of this logic of the First Lady within black communities. And you see it in a range of other locations from organizations and so on. So black women having leadership is not anything new. It's just that it has moved more into like the more central spaces uh, in this particular case now into the mainstream political arena. And what, what I was looking at was the extent to which we beginning to have uh, the whole question of competence as relates to black women's leadership has practiced in those early versions, whether you're talking black women as presidents of universities, Spellman, Brown, and so on, uh, to what we see now, uh, the rise of black women in political positions around the world. So I'm looking at Ellen Sylvie Johnson, I'm looking at uh, Portia Simpson Miller uh, in Jamaica, who became uh, prime minister. I was looking at Kamala Prasad Vesesa, who became a prime minister, Trinidadian Indian woman. Uh, and of course, the more recent versions that we see in Malawi. And this is what I'm uh, pursuing in the next uh, you know, years or so. But basically, what I'm suggesting is that black women's presence has often been camouflaged within influential political movements in pan Africanism. Uh, politics, for example, where we have a uh, knowledge of Marcus Garvey really strongly articulated, but very little knowledge of Amy Ashford Garvey, the first wife who actually helped found the UNIA, uh, which Tony Martin reluctantly admits in his recent book. <laughs> and of course, his second wife, Amy James Garvey. So you have actually the two. Uh, Timmy Garvey is, is Garvey and his contending wives. <laughs> And how they also articulated some of his vision and their vision as well. So the logic of having black uh, women as, as a accompanying political leadership is not new. And I'm wanting to read Michelle Obama. That's the first point I want to make, I suppose, in a similar kind of vein. That she's functioning almost identically then to those women who were accompanying powerful men in terms of political leadership. And I see her really absolutely doing that. So it's well documented, we know, and if you put Winnie Mandela in that picture, you see another version of the same. Whereas Winnie Mandela for 27 years, while Nelson was incarcerated, ran, pretty much ran the activist movement in South Africa. Suddenly when Nelson was released, it was as if she needed to take a back seat, all sorts of things came up, and therefore she was no longer viable as a political leader. But here you have again another model 
of that whole question of women and political leadership. I'm suggesting though that we can um, look at the resource for this of earlier women creating the building blocks for the rise of a few black women to political leadership in the contemporary period. But as well, we have to continue to ask generating questions in cautionary feminist theorizing of the choices which come with political power. And some of these have been raised really wonderfully well by my two colleagues earlier. But these questions, I argue, should focus on how gender and sexuality inform constructions and performances as well as leadership practices in the fraught context of contemporary neoliberal capitalism. So we can assess the rise of black women to, black, to political leadership in the United States as the products of decades of feminist and civil rights activism challenging the logic that leadership is always an only white and or male. While there were black male senators in the, in the immediate post-emancipation period in the United States, it was not until after the civil rights movement that we saw the steady increase of black male um, leadership and female leadership in political positions. Shirley Chisholm, you know, we can talk about that. And I was quite gratified to see Alfred Woodard is going to do a film on Barbara Jordan. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe Barbara Rands, we talked about El uh, Esma Good Robson uh, last week when she was here. So basically, the logic is that you have ongoing questions of black women in different versions of political leadership, either as accompanying men who were political leaders or themselves occupying leadership roles. And this is where you see the bifurcation I'm arguing between a Condoleezza and a Michelle Obama, because technically Michelle Obama is the white mom, even though she's occupying the position of political power. Condoleezza Rice, as much as I have a major critique of how her politics operates for you know, the Republican Party and so on, still technically was running on her own political engine and steam, and one can look at what that means in different kinds of ways, right? Um, so looking at how all of that operates, I think is really critical. So many acknowledge though that it was a common, has been a combination of race and gender that kept both Barbara Jordan and Shirley Chisholm from accessing the high offices um, that one sees today and actually getting to U.S. presidency, as you know, Shirley Chisholm did run uh, before Barack Obama, and often students are really shocked when they know that there was a black woman who actually spoke like she did and actually, uh, you know, took on that whole question of running uh, in the Democratic primaries to make it into that. But essentially, what we're seeing then in this new millennium is a number of black women who have played influential roles in, in the spheres here the two defined as holy, clean, and white. Um, Valerie Amos became Baroness. Amos was appointed by the Blair government to a ceremonial position as leader, a leader of the House of Lords, um, and is now the United Nations Under Secretary General for Human, Humanitarian Affairs in Latin America. We see also the rise of women to political leadership, Argentina, Dilma Rousseff in Brazil, and so on. And I mentioned some of them earlier. But Michelle Obama, where does all where does she fit in all of this? It, for me, it was really significant uh, in illustrating all of this to consider the cultural meanings of, attached to this first lady, Michelle Robinson Obama. And some of these have been raised already well, so I won't go into all of that. But the whole issue of what a first lady does and then how she performs it, I think, is constantly being challenged in many different ways, particularly since a first lady is supposed to be the supportive wife who just stares lovingly as her husband. Uh, Michelle Obama presents, as you showed in those images, images of strength in her physicality, unabashed assertiveness in her public persona, and a deep sense of support for community and beyond. And what I did actually, and I'm glad you mentioned the thesis, I went in and looked at the thesis completely. And actually she was talking about Princeton Educated Blacks and their service to black community published in 1985. And in this study, she analyzed themes that continue to inform the nature of her work. I differ a little bit with your analysis of that, actually, because in it, what she did was study the ways that um, educated blacks from elite universities now went or did not work with their various communities. And I said, in the end, she was basically arguing that there has to be an ongoing salience for minority students, technically, to serve who are raised on predominantly white campuses to find ways that they can be of service to the community. And this is what she comes back to repeatedly even now, even at the DNC convention, she talks about that, that this is who we are, this is what we are doing. 
This is what Barack does. This is, you know, the kinds of contributions we want to make. She also, I think, significantly, and I, I was chatting, I think, with you, the last time you were here about this, no, anyway, um, about her Princeton um, connection. And I was saying, well, the all of these have a Princeton, a first lady who is a Princeton African American studies minor. So you can get a lot of mileage of that. But I don't think she does it, right, essentially, with good reason. But why she doesn't? What happened to the issue of the, the roommate? For sure, I'm sure it is sour here for giving anything back to Princeton. Um, and also, because to me, that's an institutional decision as well, in spite of the fact that the mother wanted the girl out of the room, the institution went ahead and did it and so So they made a racist decision based on a parent, without telling the parent, well, maybe we should put your daughter in, or something. They removed Michelle from the room. So, I mean, the irony of that is amazing, because here you have a first lady, which I'm sure this person would have loved, you know, to say, Anyway, she, when she goes, and she challenges consistently the elitism of Ivy League institutions, repeatedly. When she goes to, her, to give her first talk, it's at the University of California, Merced, a working class university community, where she pointed out that when she was growing up in the south side of Chicago, the University of Chicago failed to be accessible to neighborhood children such as herself. Quote, I grew up just a few miles from the University of Chicago, yet that university never played a meaningful role in my academic development. The institution made no effort to reach out to me. Her recent charge to Spelman graduates re reiterated her own history as a professional who chose community work instead of corporate life consistently. A description of her professional trajectory indicated as well a commitment to service of economic reward. And she has also indicated, for example, quote, I was making a lot less money, but with every community I engaged, I felt more engaged in a life than I felt in years. To me, the intellectual Michelle Obama risks being obscured by influential constructions in the popular media, as many magazine images and covers well illustrate. Her presence, her knowledge, contribution, and disorienting currents in a public sphere, which has few analytical tools to engage the phenomenon of a black woman at the level of the highest globally influential political office. Right? As we watch the development of black women's leadership unfold around the world, I'm suggesting, we must realize that we, that we have entered a new period in black women's political leadership under global capitalism and new imperialism, which the president also, contrary to the two parties construction of him as a socialist and so on, represents really well. You know, he proudly says, I killed the man. So essentially, you know, you have him performing at a very high level American imperialism. Um, and if he doesn't do it too far out, you know, if he goes too far from that, they consistently pull him back and then he takes it back and he does something else. The drones that Ali Masuri talked about recently um, under his leadership has increased substantially and we have many other examples. Uh, and I was looking at Melissa Harris Perry's uh, show on Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, where there were people talking about the absence of any agenda, we already know this, that significantly targeted the black community. But basically I'm suggesting in spite of it all, that we still uh, watch then and, and need a much more developed analysis of the ways in which black women's leadership is unfolding in this period, uh, and that we acknowledge then the need to be documented appropriately and rigorously the kinds of issues we see unfolding by Michelle Obama in the context of political leadership. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much.
Uh, one of the questions that Carol raises is, uh, what black feminist issues are possible via a modern chief identity? And there's been a huge amount of debate, particularly among white feminists, about the problematic of this modern chief identity that she continues to, to embrace. And then uh, Carol also asks, uh, what kind of feminist leadership is articulated in the status of white and black first lady? I mean, so we could spend forever doing that. And then I want to uh, also mention two of the leeway's questions. Uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, has Michelle's status as first lady been affected and challenged with pathological and stereotypical images of black women? And then secondly, in what ways does she embody what it means to be a black feminist, if she does that? And, and in what ways has her faith first lady work advanced the cause of women more nationally, I mean, more, 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 more broadly? And, and so, so why, don't we, why don't we just try to deal with the, the, the gender implications of Michelle's uh, pronouncements on the one hand and the work that she's been doing uh, on the other hand. And, and so I'll just, I'll just throw it out. <laughs> well, you know, I, I wanted to address the, the mom and chief question because Michelle loves to use that. And on the one hand, it is absolutely clearly a response to that really angry black woman construction. Um, I mean, with the black woman, you just walk in the room and the angry, angry black woman stereotype shows up somehow. So that's a, a one thing. In spite of the fact that, that you know she, what she said had a whole narrative behind it, the first part of it, where she was saying, I, you know, I feel for the first time happy about the U.S., that becomes a, a problem. That becomes angry. But but the point is, when you, I mean, within feminist scholarship, the question of motherhood within certain forms of cultural feminism is considered, you know, a, a, a power position. If you look at African women scholarship and so on. The question of where motherhood rests within community always ends up being articulated as something positive. So in other words, being mom and chief is technically for black communities in, in diaspora, not particularly negative in that kind of way. However, on the other side, I mean, I just witnessed my daughter give birth. So I, I mean, that is not an easy thing to, to, to do, to be a mom, period, much more to be a mom and chief. Okay, so essentially, that's, we hold that on the side. And there's been quite a bit of scholarship on the role of mothering and feminism and so on. On the other, however, being a mom doesn't give you the power within the political cons constructs in which decisions are made. It's not valued by the dominant culture. So, so when she occupies mom in chief, she's automatically assuming all of those narratives. On the one hand, the cultural meaning of mom and mother's day and so on, and I'm running my doors and all of that. But on the other, where does that leave you in terms of political power and making decisions and so on? And I think that's the contradiction, that little nexus there that <laughs> creates the little problem. But there are others, I'm sure, that, that you all probably know. But that's one of the first ones I wanted to at least. I think one of the things that's interesting to me about thinking about Michelle is the mother of like, women's article. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, hear me. I usually check pretty well. Okay. Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting about thinking about Stereotypes. So the thing, what I got stuck in in this paper, like why it ended up being a whole big paper, is because there are these old traditional stereotypes about black women, Jezebel, Mammy, and Sapphire, right? Uh, but there's some new ones that, that are as recognizable, I was telling my husband, just think of the Tyler Perry film, right? They pretty much are all embodied in any Tyler Perry film that you want to see, the kind of new, or the, the ones, some, some of his genre, not, not that now he's new, right? Like he's that new, but his older kinds of things. Um, there's a whole thing about black women as bad mothers, right? Like so, they, you move from um, the, this feminist, white feminist narratives, really about motherhood is empowering, and, and in black communities in the 1920s, turn of the century, 
Um, there's a whole thing that Booker T. Washington and others and black women are doing about, you know, getting the homes and raise up your families and that's how we're gonna know that we actually fit. Like there's a whole thing about a narrative about motherhood that really assumes that you are a bad mother. And then you think of some more contemporary scholarship like Dorothy Roberts, who who you know, it talks about how in public policy the courts assume a kind of pathological or, or you know, a, a sort of pathological um, nature when it comes to mothering. Specifically, she talks about crack mothers right, in, in, her, in her work uh, where she locates that. So the thing that became interesting to me in sort of locating Michelle Obama in some of the more kind of contemporary years is this whole thing about working black women. Like, there, there are all kinds of sort of reworked, newer images that I don't think we think about as consistently as we do Sapphire, Mammy, and Jezebel, like we, we need your gold. Um, but we haven't really spent a lot of time really teasing out with these others, um, what they look like. So Michelle Obama, there's, there are ways <laughs> that despite her claiming of mom and she, I kept running into that, that well, wow, doesn't she kind of look like bad mother? So for example, when she talks about the reason that she got all on this whole obesity campaign is because she took her kids to the doctor and the doctor was kind of like, their health is bad. You know, and it doesn't really, it, it, I don't even know if it's true because it's at that level with political campaigns and, and public personas, the stories that people end up telling about their lives and their kids, you gotta take with a grain of salt. These two children, however, are at the highest levels of public policy because they keep deciding stuff. Apparently, Barack's involvement on gay marriage was because his daughters told him that, you know, what are you thinking? It was the whole BP, with the whole BP spill, you know, in New Orleans. You know, apparently Malia came and said, Daddy, what are you gonna do about the big hole? And that's when he decided to get involved, or at least the story that he tells. Um, his deciding to deal with immigration uh, was because, according to him, <laughs> you know, uh, because, you know, he, they had friends and they were trying to figure out what he was going to do. So these girls are basically running the country. <laughs> but what you hear about Michelle is she's doing this obesity thing because she failed, right? Because she, or neither she nor Barack noticed that their health was going down. Um, and so how is it that that this is functioning, you know, like in these two kinds of ways. And the last thing I'll say very briefly, I think there's a way, as you look at the school lunch thing, not only did she fail with her own kids, in that little way, of course she's a fabulous mother. I'm not calling her a failed mother. I'm just talking about how she knocks up against some of these images or could potentially. Uh, not only did she fail with her kids, but you know, kids have started to rise up and protest about this school lunch thing. So she, she decided that people were, were, were eating too much because we have obesity in the country. So she got the Department of Agriculture, she was a mover and shaker getting the Department of Agriculture to severely cut the number of calories for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. All these kids now are making viral videos where they are busy fainting on the floor and at gym and passing out because they're not getting enough food. Because what, uh, what obese black poor kids need, apparently, is not the same thing that wealthy white active children need. So there's this whole under the table, or kind of behind the scenes thing that's going on. Then again, when she starts mothering other people's kids, she felt so, she's, she's it's, it's complex. That's a long way of saying it, it's not complex. And I have just one point to add to this whole question of Michelle Obama framing herself as mom and she, that, that we, um, she's one of the ones that we're beginning with. And that goes back to um, an aspect of my presentation where I mentioned the video South Side Girl. Well, again, that video introduced the speech that Michelle Obama gave at the 2008 Democratic National Convention, which was intriguing to me for the levels on which um, she began by introducing herself to the U.S. public sphere as primarily a wife, mother, positioning herself in relation to, to various people in her life. But it did strike me that I think that was the place where she began to consolidate that identity as, as mom and chief. And I thought to myself, wow, well, as a person who's still single, you know, and, and who doesn't have children as yet, introducing my power, you know, I, I plead, you know, an introduction before the U.S. public sphere. And so it, it just struck me that that kind of, um, 
that sound bite has the potential to alienate, say, um, a substantial portion of the citizenry, in, including a lot of people who are single and who don't necessarily fit into those models for whatever reason. So that's one reason that I think it's important to not necessarily um, channel so many dialogues through that lens, though, it, though it's certainly helpful. And I, I um, am a deep admirer of the Obama family, and it, I think it's given us a lot to think about at a number of levels. Maybe we should open up for open up for one time. Um, thank you for uh, such stimulation, and, and, and I know this will go on for a long time. Uh, so that's why I'm gonna first. Uh, I want to just add to Carol's list of wives. Carol's list of wives uh, of politicians. Shirley Graham Du Bois. Uh, she was a closer, at least in, in Ghana, she was a closer confidant to uh, Kwame Nkrumah than her husband was. And she was very much, even before they, they left the US, she was very much, um, uh, in many ways, the political leader of, of their partnership. Okay, but, um, with regard to the image of Michelle Obama, I've just decided that, that the country just doesn't know what to do with her. Um, as a black woman, she would be, if you, if you look at photos, uh, certainly until about um, five years ago, commercials and, and, and posters and so forth, if there are three people, three Americans in the scene, it would be a white male, white female, and black male. So black women were not even in the picture of representative uh, America until, until very recently. Okay, but as Nelly Wayne has said, there are certain stereotypes that, uh, that abound and Michelle doesn't fit, has never fitted any of those. Even when people think about South, South Side Chicago, they think about male and, 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 and criminal, or at least uh, antisocial. And so uh, an educated, articulated, um, twice Ivy League graduate is not something that Americans know in black female form. And so I think that Americans, that, that, the, that the larger society has to first be able to fit her into a mold that they know of for black women, and then they can decide whether they like her or what they think about her as, as, as a first lady, but since they can't fit her into any one of those molds. Um, Hillary Clinton, before her, was an independent first lady, uh, and of course, standing by her man at the critical time, certainly just, you know, overturned all of that. But nevertheless, politically, she was, and of course, she was working with his health program, but she, she, Formed as an independent, freestanding uh, first lady who had a program, who had an agenda, of course, complimenting uh, the president, but nevertheless, she, I think, uh, set a precedent as, a, as an articulate, educated, professional first lady. I mean, she made the comment, you know, I don't stay home and bake cookies for the PTA or something. Uh, so, so I think that if Michelle has been forced to, uh, to do a makeover for the public, it is because uh, uh, the people around her have decided that she has to be presented in some palatable form, in some form that, that the American public can, can recognize. So, uh, so I think that, that they're going to continue to be criticisms. I mean, whether she does, I mean, how many of us 
don't think it's wonderful that she does push-ups on, you know. I mean, the fact of physical fitness is one of the coolest things out now. And for her to be not only, you know, talking the talk, but walking the walk and pushing up the push-up is, uh, uh, has got to be only positive. So I think that, that she's going to be criticized because the country was not ready for her. They could get ready for, or let me put it this way, it was enough for them to have to get ready for Barack, okay, a biracial, Hawaii-born, uh, 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 black male, that was enough to, to swallow. So for them to have to uh, accommodate uh, the wife into their sociological uh, um, uh, uh, construct of First Lady is just a challenge that is happening at the same time with the husband, and it's, I think this is the result. Of what 
gender or pa you you don't even talk about patriarchy. It's, it's sort of like a, an anachronistic word at this point. Um, you know, to talk about a society that is structured along gender such that one is consistently privileged over another. You ch there's no space for it. And if the rise of Barack made having um, particular kinds of complex conversations around Barack, uh, around race more difficult, right? Because now the thing is, if you work hard, everybody, you can be president. Right? I mean, that's a sort of knee-jerk kind of thing. Racism can't be that bad. Look at Barack. <laughs> he was poor. He was from a single family. And he wrote. if it made that difficult, talking about um, what the, the violence that stereotypes actually do, um, you, I, I mean, I'll end here because this is going to be a soapbox, <laughs> but um, the lack of conversation around things like uh, female slavery and trafficking in the United States, right, which is growing, and I live in the Bronx, uh, I live in Ithaca, but when I'm not in Ithaca, I have an apartment in the Bronx, and one of the issues is the numbers of 8 to 14 year old black and Latino girls who just disappear. Right, just disappear. And half the time, nobody's even looking for them. Sometimes people do. Sometimes, I mean, they're families, right? Or there isn't a family, or they're in transition, or they're housing insecure, or they what? So a lot of times, there's nobody actually looking for them. But this, the trafficking of black and Latino young girls um, is huge. It's not Thailand. It's not Eastern Europe. This is happening in communities. But there is absolutely no conversation in most black and Latino communities about it beyond why are you looking for the little white girl and you never look for mine. But taking it a step further um, to really look at the, how disposable black girls and Latino girls are. Literally disposable. That's why the traffickers want them. Because you can use them up till they're, till they're done. Um, and they either go back home and nobody believes them or cares, or you kill them. Um, and the, the, the relationship between that um, and slavery and a whole bunch of other things should not escape us. But the fact that we can have that couple in the White House and talk about race in some ways and not talk about gender at all, I think is our failure, right? I mean, I think those are individual failures. Um, so that's, a, that's my intention to answer your question, but I'm not sure <laughs> to the right answer. Let me just say, when, when Kathy Cohen, you know, who's a queer uh, black feminist theorist, goes around and talks about the problematic of this idealized, romanticized marriage, uh, it makes black people very uncomfortable. Uh, you know, it's like, okay, we have this perfect couple in front of us, and why is anybody saying anything problematic about it? And, and one of the things that really bothers me, as I mentioned, is going around listening to highly educated African American women believing that the world will be perfect if they can find an Obama. I mean, they, even saying that, that I wouldn't even necessarily have to work anymore. In, in other words, like Michelle, I can work all my life. It doesn't really matter that I have all these credentials. It doesn't really matter that I had this kind of a job. But what I, what I really want is a, is a black man who loves me, who loves me and reveres me as much as it appears that a woman does. I mean, this is very sad to me. That's, that's true. Well, <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not to the same extent, but maybe. I would not hear white or college women of longing for a woman. Uh, oh, to the same extent. But, but you know what the difference is, I think, is that they, they, they're oh, fresh out there. there and there's not this whole history. There's not, there's not this construction of blacks, of, uh, of white men as people who don't love their women. So there's a, there's, a, there's a very different kind of situation. And all I'm saying is, one of the things I keep saying is, we have images of black love. We, 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 we have had those. But somehow, somehow it's as if this is the only black couple in the world where we've seen obvious love and respect. And I think that's very sad. It's the romantic yes. uh, fantasy F that, yeah. that they seem to live in. They also don't know about some of the early history of marriage, the right. sort of normal, normal. marital issues. Yeah, well, yeah. I was really struck by the Oprah Winfrey interview with Whitney Houston. Um, 
in a lot of moments, but in, in particular where Whitney Houston said that she really didn't understand the significance of her success. She had no idea really what an icon was, or at a point it was just too overwhelming. And I think in a way, that is an example of how challenging it may be for anybody to kind of go down a trail that no one has ever walked down before. And certainly that's true of a position like First Lady. One thing that I, I think of, though, is how much I was struck even back in 2004 during the presidential election that year um, by the xenophobia that was directed at Teresa Hines Carey. And it seemed as if um, she was very unacceptable for some American citizens because of you know, aspects of her background, like her French ancestry, or even her accent. And the, the anti-foreign sentiment that came across, I think, suggested that there are certain ingrained ideologies about who the First Lady should be, where she should come from, how she should present herself. So that's just another model that I like to talk to. <laughs> no, but I, I think on the one hand, some people, I, I admire the romance of the Obama couple. I think we have to admit that people love that a black, you know, I used to, I used to Bob Marley um, line, could you be loved, you know? And a lot of black women don't feel that from black men. So you, here you have, a, at the presidential level, a demonstration of it, whether it's performance, whatever it is. And I think that is admirable. I, I, I would love to see more of that. And that is, a, you know, that is, is not a, a heterosexual or you know, patriarchal statement. It's just saying, why can black women not receive love publicly in the way that this is demonstrated? And I admire that. But having said that, I, I understand really fully the ways in which the power differential works. And you are right, Adrienne. I think at a, at a very particular level, the societal structures organize itself already uh, as you were saying, in which gender is not part of the conversation seriously. So that therefore, you know, the, the, the racial question, whether they want to frame it as post-race or whatever, gets located. At the same time, you have an amazing heightening of racism as demonstrated against the, the president and the first lady and so on. So, I mean, it's that whole question of intersectionality that, that people talk about, in other words, what happens with race and gender collapses really fully when you look. It's like you have to look at one or the other. And I I'm glad that you brought back Francis Veal, but it's not just that. It's classes, as um, Rishay's people also showed. You know, the, the question of race, gender, and class are really fully articulated by this woman. So, uh, and the president as well, I'm sorry. I, I think you do have that operating at the same time that you have them sort of navigating all those spaces so that you have discourses of incompetence from the last debate really floating everywhere, like he was incompetent, he was whatever. So that it's already you know, framed as if black people are not gonna be able to be successful in this way at, at two different levels. I think so, I'll say. So would you, one more? Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Um, yeah. Do you think that people feel more comfortable with the um, I don't have my question all the way worked out, but, um, I'm trying to think about the ways that black people consume Michelle Obama, because I think that, especially in 2008, and I see it happening again, she's really been, when Barack Obama's black authenticity has been questioned, she's been that, like, oh, well, Michelle Obama's in his ear, right? It's yeah. like, okay, and then you see from black women, her hair is laid, she looks good, I'm like, I want to be like her, and for men, like, they want their Michelle, right? Um, but, I'd just like to hear from you guys some of how black love of Michelle Obama and of the Obama family um, kind of looks politically because we're also at this moment where Barack Obama hasn't really earned a lot of a lot of political help from black people in the past four years. Um, and Michelle Obama is out there really hard. Um, and it's like he is really this figure of neoliberal capitalism. He is a figure of imperialism in this moment of expanding warfare and what it looks like to have this family uh, 
representing all of that right now. Yeah. I, I just want Kimberly Crenshaw, I was talking to Kimberly at the conference in Manchester, and she was sitting around talking, and she had this amazing reference. She said, when Obama signed that Al Green, I'm so in love with you, he did the classic thing of the black guy who didn't really love you, but now he's like, you got to And he played it for the entire community. So I thought, you know, she really touched on something interesting where that is concerned. So that in other words, he doesn't have to really do love for black people, but he can go and say, hey, man, you know, I love you. And essentially, that's what's going on according to Kimberly, and I, I definitely agree with her in terms of performing it with Lash. And at the same time, he, you know, I place, I see him doing the gangster. He plays gangster sometimes. When he is able to walk on and say, I just killed Bin Laden after having laughed at the press club of Donald Trump's hair and so on, at the same time when Bin Laden was being killed, that's straight out of Godfather. So essentially, he plays, performs presidency, and, yeah, an amazing number of levels. Um, and I think that's the interesting thing. But I guess the, you know, the, the black love question, I think that the thing that made black women feel comfortable was that he had a black woman. And he didn't have like a, a woman who's very light, with straight hair, he didn't have a white woman, he didn't have all those other things. He had a woman who was physically looking like a darker skinned black woman and what he is. And often very successful men tend to not do that. They tend to, tend to go the opposite direction. So I think that's the other fascination. I think that I know people around the world, when they think about Michelle, feel comfortable that he made that kind of choice for whatever. I know there's all kinds of debate about why and why he chose a black guy. I don't want to go there. <laughs> I just wish, you know what? I, I wish, I mean, where was Michelle during the Shirley Sherrod case? I, 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 if what we read is true, which, which is not like, you know, if she does not get involved at all in any political discussion, if she is totally outside of that, then that, that's, I mean, I think she should be talking to him about things other than uh, whatever it is that she talks about. I think that she should say something to him about Shirley Sherrod. Well, if, if what we read is true, if what we read is true, that she does not go there, I think that that's a problem. Because I think that she could be helpful to him around issues of race. I mean, one of the one of the things I was in a little private dinner with Shirley Sherrod after the, that debacle, and she she had a conversation with Obama. She said she was absolutely stunned that Obama said to her, she said something. She said she said something very candid to him about his racial politics, and he said to her, "Oh, have you read my book?" And she said she she said, "You know, you you." If you, let's just, you need, need to admit you don't know anything about Southern black culture. And rather than, rather than saying to me, you should read my book, she said, you need, to, you need to come to the South and you need to know something about black community and culture. Okay, those are the kinds of things I'm trying. I don't want Michelle to say to Obama those kinds of things. And I don't really think that she does. And I think that that's very problematic. But we won't know until after the presidency, as she writes. But, but everything that he told her, man. But everything, everything that he read, he told her she, she, she just not do that. He didn't listen. I mean, all black women talk to these Yeah, but I don't listen. I don't listen. <laughs> Thing, 
Will and Jada and Jay-Z and Beyonce are not, you know, the, it, so apparently the ways that 50-year-old black women vote is the ways that the Democratic Party, the people in the Democratic Party, the black folks who vote in overwhelming numbers are, are black women, who are, which is a whole other conversation to have about gender politics, right? We're always like black people, the Democratic Party taking black people for, for granted, but in fact, the over, it's like 70%, like the numbers are all out of whack. Um, of the black people who consistently vote are black women who are over 50. Um, for them, I'm not sure that Jay-Z and Beyonce are doing the same work, that looking at people who are, you know, singing Let's Stay Together and, you know, having an Etta James joint at the, at the inauguration, right? I mean, that's, that's, as Stevie Wonder is your first, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and Stevie Wonder are the first folks you were invited. Like, that's a generational kind of, speaking to, right? <laughs> like, um, and I, I think that we are star, um, literally, at a certain level for, for that, for all kinds of reasons that are worth exploring. Um, but yeah. That's so nice. And I just want to um, mention that I think that there's a kind of hypocrisy in the way that the Obamas have been loved over the years. I think one of the most extreme examples, for instance, is the fact that Obama's Dreams of My Father was published in 1995, or at least was initially issued that year, and it kind of came and went. You know, it was published primarily on the occasion of his election, a president election, really, to the editorial leadership of the Harvard Law Review. And the book just disappeared but became amazingly popular once he entered the mainstream and in a, in a, in a way that's how um, publishing can work or popularity can work. As recently as 2000 for instance, Obama couldn't get onto the floor at the Democratic National Convention and even for a long time into the presidential campaign the first time around, he didn't have the support of like, you know, certain cross sections of the black community, certain leaders, until there was a widespread perception that he could win. And then all of a sudden we witnessed this sea change. So I think that in a way I thought to myself, well, the Obamas have always been the Obamas. It's like, they, they're smart people, brilliant people, and what makes people ignore certain folks? Even with all of those redeeming qualities until they feel that you know there's something to be gained by being associated with them until they see maybe one too many magazine covers and are like, well, I want to get on board. So. Okay, I'll come this one. You're speaking on behalf of all men, right? For the sake of the symbolism itself. The question is really related to uh, specifically what Carla mentioned is in terms of the paper that you mentioned. Uh, you, you mentioned a lot of examples, especially in Africa. There's a rising number of women who are now like in Malawi, mm -hmm. in Nigeria, and so forth. And of course, if you take Africa or Asia, you know, better than the United States at least at some point that they have you know, women in Bangladesh as a woman present. But, and symbolism, I, I understand, is very important in terms of breaking barriers and, and patriarchy and so forth. But, what is interesting is that these changes are happening in the world that's really shifting completely from our in Europe and Africa, in which you know the fear power the most of And if you look at Johnson's side, for example, yeah. her background is really the world back. Well, back. And so I was wondering what do you make of this in terms of these shifts? Because you brought it as a companion, I'm sure you okay, we may have mentioned more about it. But I'm very much interested. study it and study each of those cases and that's what I, I want to do. Um, and I think all of the, not just of course, I mean if you put Obama in the mix, although you mentioned all of the women, they're operating very specifically from a capitalist economy and they're trying to do the best they can within that framework. And how to navigate that, I think that is the question. So to me that's the future. I think this is the future, but the point is, 
you know, correct, correctly raised, does it mean that if you have women, it's going to mean transformative leadership? It's difficult to see. I, one of the things I noticed, though, and we did, um, Ellen Sidney Johnson, um, I was looking at women political leadership in the class a couple of years or so. And people like Ellen Sidney Johnson identify having been physically abused. Um, and, and you find the same thing with the woman from Malawi Joyce, Stand Up, in this name. So you, you find that they have Margaret Matai physically abused as well. So you have really women who are in leadership who are really knowledgeable at a personal level about some of the complications of being a black woman in situations of difficulty and so on. How does that translate then into political leadership? That's the question. And I think one has to then subject all of them to the same kinds of political questions I raised with Condoleezza. Once they're involved, who are they representing? You know, I think we're the only group that end up not really representing ourselves when we are in political power. We represent everybody else. And it happens at a political level, it happens at an institutional level, and so on and so on and so on. So I think to me that's the that's where to me a lot of discussion um, on the question of women and political power should go. But I think that's what I'm doing. Surely you take a very retrograde position around sexuality issues, which is very Yeah, I mean just Rapidly, I mean, just deep down, you know. So it's very frustrating. Yeah. And when she came to Spelman, I can just tell you, all the women who come to Spelman are very disappointed. How is Michelle? Let me start with Sergey. Yeah. Uh, Sergey is a very conservative, uh, pro-capitalist, pro. pro uh, didn't mention any of her women's movement work. Uh, talk, uh, talk about her, her role models for being to, uh, was Mother Teresa. Uh, they were all white. This, this was coming to this family. She mentioned all these white uh, uh, role models. Didn't say anything that was, you know, didn't, didn't say anything that was helpful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, that was a of and she was also, uh, I, I sat at the table with her little dinner before. She was very unfriendly. I didn't talk with her. Uh, Oprah's speech last year was just, uh, I mean, I, I, it was just unbelievably disgusting. She talked about herself the entire time. It was, self, it was, it was just, it was embarrassing. Um, you would not have known that Michelle was the first lady when she spoke at Spelman. It was a, it was a, it was a, it was a wonderful commencement speech, speech about Spelman's founders. She, she of course, had no critique, I mean, she had no critique of those white women missionaries. So she invoked them. I was really even surprised that she kept calling them Miss. And I know she would do that because that's what's in the spell history, though we tried to get it out. But she kept calling them Miss of Giles and Miss Pack, and it was a traditional, wonderful missionary to white women who came to spell. And she talked about that legacy. And she did. She did mention Marion, and she did mention another alum. But she didn't. She didn't say anything to them. It, it was a kind of commencement speech that you would give to just a regular professional black woman out there running around. She didn't say anything at all about even being in the White House. She didn't say vote. She didn't say do anything that way. It had not one little ounce of politics in it. It was, you know, this is your legacy. Go and do well. I mean. So it was just, I mean, the, it's, I mean, she had an opportunity, I think, to say something even mildly progressive to these, uh, uh, I mean, why don't she, but you know, they, they, know the, they know the story of the founders. You don't need anybody to come there and tell them the story of the founders. That's true. <laughs> you know, so, so I, I wanted her to do something else, to say something to them about what it might even mean to navigate this complex life that she lives. And it was just a traditional commission speech, and she But I think there, these are speeches that are canned and written. No, she presentation. And then yeah, they're she, not going to come to front, but they're going to be part of it. Well, that's OK. But I'm just simply saying that there was nothing in the speech. Uh, she, she, she actually wrote the speech herself. This was not crafted by somebody else. That we that, 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 that know. I'm just simply saying. That, that she, she has a platform. 
And I don't think you need to come to Savannah and tell the students about the founders, because they've heard that 10,000 times. That, 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 that's what I'm saying. I'm very frustrated when, when the, um, the Michelles, the Sirleaves, the, what's the name, the, the Wynn, Oprah, and whoever else comes, and, and it just doesn't say anything that's, that's useful. But you know, people loved it, um, but that, 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 that's what I'm saying. Uh, and, and, and by the way, she did not stay. She gave her 10 minute speech and she left and went to a fundraiser. Didn't, didn't stay through the, you know, all of that. Whereas Obama did when he went to that poor high school, low income high school in, in, uh, in, 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 in Memphis, Tennessee, my hometown, stayed. And, you know, so this is what I'm talking about. That it was just very, very disappointing. She just came in for you know. I think uh, I just wanted to maybe hear it. It is a deception, and we continue. I just want to thank you so much. It was an amazing.